welcome everyone. Uh, now please select the language you want to hear using the globe icon at the bottom of your screen, interpretation. And then you will not need to change the language channel again after that. You will still hear the speaker in the original language at a lower volume, but you can also choose to mute the original in the interpretation menu. Uh, welcome everyone to this session on gender with Daniel Brathwaite Shirley and Yudergis Espinosa Milloso. My name is Ana Gonzalez Rueda and I'm chairing today's conversation. This is the second session of a series titled Decolonization in the 2020s, which explores practices that question and critique colonial legacies in contemporary art making, curation, teaching, and critical art writing. These events particularly consider the key stakes of decolonization in the 2020s and the problematics of attempting to do so within and through institutions. I'd like to acknowledge the organizers, Amanda Carneiro, André Mesquita, and Cristina Souza at the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, Jaisa Hernandez Velázquez from Goldsmiths, Angelie Dalal Clayton and Susan Fuisen Locke at the University of the Arts London Decolonizing Arts Institute, and Amber Hussein and Mark Lewis at After All. Uh, Yudarkis and Daniel will each share some of their work and then we will move on to the conversation. And of course, we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please post them on the QA button at any point and we'll get to them later. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded and will be available at the Central St. Martin's YouTube, YouTube channel and the MASP and After All Art School websites. Now let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Daniel Brathwaite Shirley is a London-born, Berlin-based artist working predominantly in digital media to communicate the experiences of being a Black trans person. Their practice focuses on reporting the lives of Black trans people, intertwining lived experience with fiction to imaginatively retell trans stories. Spurred on by a desire to record the history of trans people, both living and past, their work can often be seen as a trans archive where Black trans people are stored for the future. Black, queer, and trans people have been historically erased from archives. This is why Daniel considers necessary not only to archive their existence, but also the many creative narratives used to share their experiences. Daniel's work, which traverses game design, performance, and sound art, has been shown at Focal Point, Science Gallery, NU, Barbican, Tate, Les Hubas, as well as being part of the BBC Alternative Graduate Show at Copeland Gallery and you will find an online component of their work at their website, which I will also post in the chat. And then we will also hear from Yudergis Espinosa Miñoso, who is a writer, researcher, professor, and activist of Afro-Dominican origin. She is part of the Latin American Group of Studies, Education, and Feminist Action. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in social sciences and education from the Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences in Argentina, and a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Buenos Aires. However, she considers she's been mostly self-taught. Her work explains the necessity of adopting a decolonial feminist perspective by reflecting on and confronting the hegemonic Eurocentrist Eurocentric, racist, and classist perspectives that are intertwined in the feminist movement. Her PhD thesis developed a critique of the coloniality of feminist reason in Latin America under the tutelage of Maria Lugones, and it has become one of the fundamental reference of decolonial feminism in Avialala. She is the author of many articles and editor of books on decolonial feminism, such as Ethnocentrism and Colonialism in Latin American Feminisms, Weaving Other Modes, Feminism, Epistemology, and the Colonial Beds in Navia Yala, Toward a Construction of the History of the Disencounter, the Feminist Reason and the Anti-Racist and Decolonial Agency in Navia Yala, The Future Already Was, a Critique of the Idea of Progress in the Sex, Gendered, and Queer Identitarian Liberation Narratives in Navia Yala, as well as Why Decolonial Feminism is Necessary, Differentiation, co-constitutive domination of Western modernity and the end of identity politics, among others. 
She is currently working on the compilations Decolonial Latin American, Caribbean, and Latin Feminism Contributions and Challenges, edited with Maria Lugones and Nelson Maldonado Torres, and Decolonial Feminism, New Theoretical and Methodological Contributions after more than a decade. Her work is being translated into English, German, French, Italian, and Portuguese. So welcome both Daniel and Duderkis, and we'll start now with Daniel, I hand over to you. Hi, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Okay. Um, so hi, my name is Danielle Brathway Shirley. And I consider myself an archival activist. And essentially what that boils down to is that I create interactive archives that can be played by anyone online that center black trans people. Um, all of this came from um, a desire to see black trans people represented in the archive and not finding any during um, a long bout of research. And those that I did find were often secondhand accounts and archived with a certain violence that erased their existence. So I wanted to create archives that would center black trans people and also not erase them while archiving them. Um, and a lot of my inspirations that had come to me at the time were from video games um, and were from translating a, a black person and putting them into a virtual space. Um, and I wondered if, um, if we did that, and if we created the world and if we created um, the space and the conditions in which the space was run by, could this virtual avatar, these virtual spaces hold something about our existence um, for the future? And so a lot of my research went into character customizations, into um, online massive um, role-playing RPGs, and the communities that spring up around these and that enable them to exist and enable um, them to archive more than what the developers actually wanted them to. And so most of my work starts from a place of writing my own terms of conditions. And so this, for, this one was written for uh, we are here because of those that are not, which is also called blacktransarchive.com, um, which is an archive that was created with 15 other black trans people. And we designed characters for them. We designed landscapes based on them, put the, took pictures of them and put their skin in the landscapes. And everything had to center them without recreating trauma or, or pain or um, something that I call focusing on trans tourism, we wanted to avoid that and focus on actually what's important to archive about black trans people themselves. And so these terms and conditions were something that we swore by for the entirety of the project. And if you want to enjoy the work, you also have to swear by these conditions themselves. And my approach to 3D space is more of a diary. Um, I 3D render every single day. And for me, it's a way of noting down my own experiences. Um, and experiences that uh, I and others around me have. Um, and I think there's like a lot of untapped power within this 3D space that can allow us to have conversations on archiving, on the failures of an archive and how you can archive someone that has formerly been erased. Um, and so I'm gonna, and so this is an example, I always put this one up. So this is an example of how I take things from the real world and put them in 3D spaces. So often my worlds um, are created from pictures of the people I'm working with. So for example, the image on the left-hand side is a, a 3D floor textured with someone's hair. And on the right-hand side is the image I use of the hair and I kind of like doctor it and change it in order so that the foundations of the world that I'm making have black transness within them and so that they don't um, so they can hold the experiences that we want to tell um, and put on top of them and for me a lot of the archives that i build are all based around choices and what i mean by that is that the choices that those that make before they get to the archive will also determine what the archive allows them to see as well as the choices they make within this own archive will determine if they can access certain information or not. For example, identity is a huge uh, choice uh, within the archive. So you choose what your identity is and depending on what your identity is will determine what you are allowed um, to see and what you're not ready to see or what you're not able to see because 
because your, your life experience is different. And so, um, I'm just checking my time. Okay, cool. Um, and so, one of the pieces um, I'm just going to talk about really quick, which you can play online, it's called resurrectionlands.com or resurrectionland.com. Um, and this work um, follows the journey. Okay, I'm going to give a quick description. Essentially, uh, the story around it is that in the future, there's a technology that allows us to scan the earth and bring back the memories of our ancestors and store them digitally. Those digital memories become sentient and eventually are co-opted into an e-sport. So this archive of these digital ancestors is misused. Um, and the film I made about this was um, trying to talk about this thing I call trans-tourism, this idea that there are certain people that like points of interest of people's lives, but aren't there for the safety and um, aren't there for the betterment of those people, but instead to take from them. And so I made a whole film and game around um, archiving black trans people and not misusing them essentially. And that's what Resurrection Lands is and turned out to be. Um, and this is a, a image of what it looks like when you're playing it. And depending on your choice, you get this world or you get a different one. Um, another game I've made, um, and I call them games and archives just because there's no black trans people in the game industry, so I'm claiming that. Um, so the other archive is, we are here because of those that are not, and here's the example of someone playing it. And the first question they ask you, and I talked about this slightly earlier, is what did you identify as? And there's over two hours of footage in here, all created and designed by a bunch of different black trans people. I just 3D rendered it all. And depending on what you pick, you will get a completely different experience. Um, and this is just the first choice, and there's like a load of branching paths that come out from that. Um, but our, our main objective with this one was an archive that centers black trans people and does not recreate any trauma at all. That doesn't mean there's no conversation around trauma, but it does not boil down any individual to anything they have experienced in their life, and instead focuses on the things that they feel are important to be stored within an archive. And I can't remember a time I didn't need you. Ooh. Um, is a very muddy looking game, all made out of GIFs. And essentially is a text-based adventure in which you go through a world which a fog has overtaken and you go to determine if the fog is there for you or the fog is there because of you. Um, and in this place, you encounter a variety of different beings, of different humans, uh, different places that you can go. Um, and each of these will require you to input information in um, that the world will essentially judge you by. Um, so the first example is your name. Um, then again, your identity. I guess you're sensing a little theme. Um, and then something that I move more into is having you write down certain and answer certain questions, but in your own words, and those words being used um, against you or with you or alongside you in the work. So here I ask what privileges do you have and what you note down will then be used later on. And you will have to ask another, answer another question based on the answer that you did give. Um, and that's the end of my slides. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, for that. That was quick, but um, already so many complex issues to discuss, you know, even starting from just the aesthetics of your work, uh, the violence of the archive, the use and misuse of digital technologies. Uh, so we'll get to, to those later on. Uh, but now we will hear from Yuderkis. Ah, uh, your microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here with you. I am in the Caribbean right now. I'm in Haiti. Let's see if you can hear me okay. I guess the mic is fine now. Okay, so um, I am from the Dominican Republic, but right now, I'm in Haiti and I am a person who has 
identified in the past few years with this movement of the decolonial feminism. Um, as part of my work, what I can tell you is that I've always been an activist. I have been in the marginalized community, I would say, you know, a community that is the, the condemned of the earth. I am African-American. Uh, I come from a working family, a poor family. And well, I had the privilege to go to university. And from then on, I became more of a feminist, you know, in, in the university. For me, it is impossible not to talk about what I do without telling you a little bit about myself, my all the subjectivity my and my experiences. You see, I have had to build a different outlook on the world, a different perspective. And then suddenly I noticed that that took me to philosophy as well to be able to rethink the world, to revisit that experience with a different perspective about race, about my body, about this uh, condemned people that I mentioned before. And then at this certain point in my production, I started writing. I actually, I started writing before this decolonial stage in my life, I would say. So I had been writing already for a while, but then suddenly what I noticed is that all those tools, those concepts, those analytical tools that I use to recreate the world and also analyze my own experience, I noticed that there was some silence in there. There was a mute silence that I couldn't really express in words and the vocabulary that I knew. And then, I noticed that I needed to start yet another search, a search for a yet completely different path, something that I didn't know where I was going, really, what direction I was going to follow, but that took me to philosophy and reflections that I do nowadays. So that path, that new path, took me to the possibility, or actually to the need, to the need of hearing those voices those voices that had been silenced, not just by colonialism and by the racial structure, you know, or by capitalism or by imperialism, even globally, not just by that, but also by the, the feminist movement where I was inserted in a way. I usually say that there is an awakening, as Franz Fano used to say. It is an awakening. It is a moment where you look at yourself in the mirror and you can see yourself. You can finally see yourself from that completely different conjunction, you know, between what you thought you were and what other people thought you were and the representation that they had about you. So that makes me understand what I didn't know before, what I didn't know in terms of the interests of the elite, the elite that dominated the world and still dominates the world and still on the feminist movement and the right representation or the valid representation of women, what women are represent in the world. Anyway, this is where at that point, at that moment, this is where I started thinking about race as well and that racial structure in the United States and other places. And then I started this whole trajectory where I had to expand my ability to hear, to listen to the people that would be the other of the others, as I like to call them. So the other people, the, the ones who had a representation of feminism, the ones who had the ability to represent that. And they had that ability because there were some others that just like the colonial subject, they didn't have a representation about themselves because they that representation had been captured 
by modern times and everything that is implied by that. So thinking about art and all kinds of art, really. And also the very theory of feminism. So basically, this is what is the foundation of everything that I started working with in 2007 or 2008, approximately, when I published the project about this theme. And then I said, well, this is not just a simple problem of being colonized by the North or by Europe or by the United States or by the feminist theory that is being developed in those places. But here there is also an internal issue that is also responding to that colonialism. So we have to see how that is going to work within feminism, without, within feminist movements. So we have to see how feminist women who were in the national elites were capturing the sense of feminism in their countries. And they, these women, they were able, thanks to their influence they were able to also work with those new theories that were being produced so you see what they were doing was basically translate all those theories they were making that that bridge building that bridge to be able to capture the experience who of the people who didn't have a voice they were trying to capture that experience and then build a bridge and bring all those concepts and those ideas to the rest of the people. Because they were in the elite, they had more power to do that. So they brought that to the whole society. From that moment on, I talked to Maria Lugones, I, well, I have to say she became a real inspiration for me and I started talking to her about gender coloniality as well and we started thinking how can we apply and if we can apply all that, how does that concept work, what Maria Lugones does, how can we apply that to think about what happens in our communities, in our society not just in the Western world. I mean, what happens to the black bodies of men and women, the non-normative bodies, and how can we interpret all that outside of those categories that were produced by the feminist, Western feminist movement? So in all that path, in all that process, I started with a lot of criticism to the very theory of the general theory of feminism, because there is this criticism against the hegemonic feminism, right? And I concluded that the, the issue is not just related to that, but actually it goes beyond. It, it goes through all the feminism concept, with a few exceptions, of course, which are the small movements that weren't really taken seriously by feminism because they were, you know, against that narrative just like the black feminism or the feminism of color. But also there were some movements in Latin America by women that were not told according to the concept of feminism, but they still, they were fighting. They were trying to combat something. It was a community fighting and women had their own voice. And they were also thinking about that need to rethink within those fights, to rethink how coloniality also imposes a certain model in society for men and women, where there's a certain hierarchy of men over women. You see, there is a lot of gender issues here. There is a normative issue here, really. So that is also part of colonialism, coloniality, actually. So this is what I am talking about when I say criticism. We have to think about how that is connected with the assessments, the perspectives, and the outlook produced by the Western world. And all that is completed 
with the illustration, with all of the philosophers, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, etc., etc. So they had already set some foundations. And using those foundations, we have some important things about feminism that were established in the very beginning. And all that was playing an important role in modern times, in, especially in Europe and developed countries. So anyway, that was the foundation for me to start working on a lot of investigation. I've always been interested in applying those analyses to think about representation more profoundly and to think about that the, the fact that Europe represents the, the colonial subject as well from visual arts, from painting, from photography, and illustrations as well. I also investigated about television, about the different media, different media channels, and the representation of the colonial subject as a barbarian, as someone without any uh, agency, someone without any history, someone that is I would say even rude or without any knowledge and extremely ugly, right? The best representation of what ugly ugliness means. So I started investigating about all that, how those images appeared in the, in the narratives and the diaries of the different expeditions to Amer to the Americas, to the wild Americas, as they would call our territory. So anyway, there is a very interesting project done by Mariluz Prat. Actually, uh, she works with that idea of representation of the Americas from those images, from those narratives that are built in those diaries, travel diaries in the expeditions in centuries 17 and 18, especially in 17, 18 and 19. There are some other things as well that I work with in this conversation. And I am a person who likes poetry as well. I'm, I'm really interested in poetry and I like reading poems a lot. I sometimes even write poems, even though it is not what I do the most, but one of the things that interested me, that was interesting for me, was trying to analyze how self-representation would be important in the self-image of indigenous women in Latin America and the Caribbean and in poems, how poets, um, see themselves and how can they can represent the world, making a parallel here. And then we compare this to the analyses that we see in feminist literature where the focus is on gender and the difference with the, with the liter literary canon leaving aside all the profound differences that are racial, class differences, and geopolitical differences. So I was interested in seeing how there are some, there's some representation through literature from indigenous women and Afro women who go even beyond um, all these writings that we see of European women or women of European descent. Well, that's what I wanted to say, and we can continue to talk after the questions. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction to your work. Uh, I just want to say I do have many questions, uh, but if you, Daniel, you there have also questions that maybe for each other also, please feel free. Uh, but maybe uh, starting with Danielle, um, maybe can you tell us a bit more, I was very interested how you spoke about the potential use and misuse of digital technology and your interest 
uh, and in the use of digital technology to expand Black trans people visibility and futures. Can you speak about those sites? Yeah, um, so for me, I feel very strongly about us taking charge of archiving ourselves. I feel that often when other communities try and archive a community they have, let's say, interest in, there's so many things they miss out on because they assume uh, in the tiny bit of research that they have got some everything, you know, and then they say, okay, blanket rule, we can just expand what we looked at. And for me, what I find uh, amazing about our current like, world of technology is that um, we can finally say what we want to say uh, freely using a variety of different means, such as like Instagram, our own websites, Facebook, private groups, WhatsApp, whatever. We can kind of disseminate and uh, archive what we want to say. Um, but for me, I want to localize those things away from conglomerate kind of markets such as like Instagram, such a big tech essentially. Um, and uh, something that I feel quite nervous about is the, the code and the secret kind of terms and conditions contracts that we sign into when we make a profile on Facebook or YouTube or any of those. And that process that allows us to so easily archive ourselves actually behind it has something that will easily erase everything that we've done to remember those that we're interested in as well as the topics that we want to talk about. So for me, it's about building a foundation away from big tech that makes the terms and conditions very clear that I'm archiving a, a certain subset of people and that this work, the foundations from the code to the songs that we put into the archive are made for black trans people to remember black trans people to archive their experiences and anything that doesn't suit that needs to be removed from that space and so when i think about technologies i i often think that we need to take charge of what they what they do and what they're held in i often think of them as like a container um, and that container is just as important as the information inside um, say for example if you go and publish a book and the publishing house is trash they can get an editor that will edit out a lot of the things that you're very interested in that need to be there to make the book make sense for you. Um, and it's the same with a website, it's the same with online content. The container will change and warp the distortion of the truth, your truth, the truth that you're trying to um, say and display in order so it fits a more neater bin binary uh, manner or binary kind of explanation of what they can understand. So. I'm trying to kind of, I guess, rally against that and create archives that are not traditional at all, that use completely untraditional means of archiving people. But that's because we haven't quite found a technology or a way to do it that keeps us um, from being erased or being misremembered. Uh, is there also there like a concern for safety? Um, is there a concern? Well, in my own archives, no, because I'm, you know, we're, we're running them, so we don't, we we know we're fine because we create the space um, that makes it. Because usually they're done with workshops, so everyone in the workshop, I run the space, only black trans people allowed in the space, so that usually we're not really worried about safety. We're worried about how people use them. Um, I was speaking to someone who uh, runs an online archive, and one of the biggest problems they have is people taking images and misusing them out of context completely in order to fit a uh, particular narrative so that, that person is fishing for an image to fit a narrative even if that image does not construct the narrative on its own and for me that's why choices within this archive are so crucial and at the forefront because your choices also need to be remembered by the archive to make sure it's aware of what you're doing within it and with it um, and that's something that archives don't often do. They're not autonomous. So they usually allow you to use them in whatever way. And that's something that I don't want in my archive. You have to use them in the way with the context that they are supposed to be used rather than in the way that you see fit to use them. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I also have a question for Yuderkis. Uh, who has spoken about this turning point uh, in your work and you have written also about the need to uh, desandage and maybe to unlearn basic precepts of feminism, saying that 
it's not easy to face the monster when you discover that you're part of it. So would you tell us why it's so important to reveal the idea of unity in oppression as an illusion? Your microphone again. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry, I forgot that I was on mute. Okay. What you mentioned about desandar, to unlearn, is connected to this discovery of not being a part of this world or the model of the world that we're criticizing. I think that one of the issues that we face in these moments i'm sorry my dog is here barking away i'm sorry precisely now when i'm speaking i hope that you can't hear my dog too much okay well one of the issues that we face after a decade of this decolonial criticism is has to do with responses that were searched for answers that were sought and quickly we think that it's settled, that the issue is settled or paid off. And one of, something that I think is key, I'm sorry, my dog is, can you hear my dog? Yes, of course you can, right? Is, is it bothering or can I continue speaking? Okay, well, an issue is that I think that we haven't criticized, we haven't had a very incisive critique in the sense of how social movements reproduce and are filled with colonialism. So that's why we have to review feminism and I think it's a political proposal and that's why it's so important but it isn't an issue just in feminism I think that it's all political movements that we have especially in urban movements are filled with that coloniality and that desire of for that world for that type of the type of world that we desire is what modernity is proposing the question that I always ask is, in the case of feminism, what is the ideal of that free woman, of that liberal woman that feminism produces? So when we think about how we have to carry out this work of self-criticism, what I want to say here is that it's very necessary to do this. Not because we criticize does it mean that we are exempt from that what, which we're criticizing. So the worst is when you realize that you're part of that monster, right? That monster that you're fighting against, that you're facing, you're giving continuity to that, right? We are giving continuity to that through our political projects. And that produces oppression and domination. So in that sense, something that I a metaphor that I use is this unlearning, this desandar, and this is a metaphor that I've used. First, I started using it in a poem where I use the a mythological character of the Caribbean called Siwapa, and it's a woman, and I've and I'm woman, quote unquote, right? Because it's a construction of modern of modernity, this whole construction, this whole idea of women. So that's why I'm saying women, quote unquote. So the Siwapa would be this quote unquote woman that when she walks, because she lives in the mountains, and when she walks, she walks with her feet backwards. So I use that metaphor of the Siwapa, which is actually a bird. Um, it, as a way of going back to that which 
enunciates all of the territorial movements and community movements in Avellana. And that was the continent that was later called America, right, by the colonizers. And that order, we always speak our, about our past and the past is that which allows us to walk forward. So we say we walk with the past before us, in front of us. So some of these epistemologies say this, we walk with the past in front of us. The past is actually not past. Our, our dead loved ones are a part of our experiences and they're there when we experience the world, when we live the world and when we, and they're in our dreams and in our hope that necessity of always bringing the past to the present. And there's another way of saying that I've also used other terms in my, in my work. And there is one phrase used in Guatemala and indigenous movements. They say that the future has already passed. And that kind of plays around with what I was saying before in the sense that modern times has built this idea that the only person who dreams can dream a world or a, a utopia facing forward and the only one that can do it is the person who has a project for the future, for anything that exists. So what I try to say with this this and that with unlearn is I try to be a part of all these voices and and ontologies and I try to remember that every culture every community has had a project of a good world of the type of ideal world an ideal world of justice and living in harmony in the world and modern times have imposed it's it has imposed its own its own way of being and it tries to get rid of and hide and take legitimacy away and exterminate other ontologies all those other ontologies and all those ways of thinking and recreating the world so this whole issue of the future is already here and unlearning what that gave me was that it made me understand that more than looking towards the future it's key for us to look at the models the community models the ideals that were produced by those people that were condemned as a past of humanity's past. So that past isn't in the past, in the long, in the far away past. It's still there. And we have to realize that there are many more realities than the ones that we see. And they're still there. And maybe they're agonizing because nowadays they're being completely attacked by this capitalism this death culture right but they're resisting they're standing strong and in that standing strong it's not a a resistance for their life but it's what guarantees the possibility um, of life on this planet and continuity of this life on this planet and what they want is this planet to continue to exist the other model proposed by modern times is a death model and it's leading us to death. Thank you. Thank you so much. The idea that the future is already past is, is just fascinating. And there's uh, some questions coming from the audience as well. But uh, before we get to that, I do have a couple more questions. And going back to uh, Daniel, uh, I, you've talked about uh, in the past about the institutional expectation of black trans artists to produce work about trauma and pain. 
Uh, could you tell us more instead about the significance of joy in your work? Yeah, um, this is something that someone once said that they were waiting for something bad to happen when they were watching my work and it never happened. And for me, that was like a moment where I realized, okay, we're doing something right. Because um, for me, I, I want to celebrate black trans life. Like I know we go through a lot of stuff, but I know that in celebrating this in the ways of through a narrative, through a story, through um, something that is speculative and looks towards making something for the future as well. Like we get to create something that we want to see and that little bit of representation that actually focuses on us, hopefully will make something um, last longer for, for us and be more important for us rather than something that focuses on um, like whiteness or supremacy or something like this. Of course, those are topics and themes that come up, but I feel like often when we get the chance to make something, uh, we have to center it around those that are hurting us rather than us. And I'm, I'm trying to do the work that allows us to center the conversation on the things that we want, the things that we want to see, that we want to talk about before finishing all the other work, because we're still continually having to do that. But when I do these workshops, when I say, what do you want to archive about yourself? We don't know. And it takes a long time for us to figure out actually what is important about ourselves that needs to be remembered for those in the future to look back on. And it takes a long time to even tease that out because we're never given the chance to ask these questions of ourselves. We're never given the opportunity to say, we are actually centered. We don't have to focus on anything else but us. Now, what does that mean? What's, what does that mean? What's next? Um, and for me, I'm constantly asking that question, like, what's next? Like, what is next for us? Like, okay, so when we get this representation, what do you want it to look like? Let's start on that. When you want someone to hear what you want to say, what do you want to say? Like, just say it. Let's put that right in. Um, and so I'm really focused on, like, trying to, and it always comes back, just trying to center us and making sure um, every time we go off on a tangent, um, when we talk about like oppression, whiteness, tra trauma, that we center us who are in the archive and us who are also playing. Um, and something that I think about a lot is, I often think about my audience as a black trans audience. And I say, if my audience is black and trans, can this be in here? Should this be in here? And how should I translate this experience, this, this act, this play, whatever, um, the story into an experience that centers black trans people watching it? Um, and for me, that, that comes with access, so everything's available online, that comes with accessibility also, easy to play, easy to understand, very clear, um, that comes with references that only we understand, that comes with referencing our, our history, by which I mean those that have come before us that we, we know about. Um, and also just like playing with expectations, like I love to play with expectations of what you're going to see and what you expect to see. Um, and so even when I'm talking about joy, I can do it in a way using horror. And I love using horror and I love using like strange, creepy things. For me, um, like trying to branch out in those ways and saying like, when you're talking about black transness, when you're talking about an archive, it doesn't have to look dry. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be something that uh, finds you, takes you ages to understand what you're looking at, is written in a language that's not for you, is written in a way that you have to study 15 books to understand. Instead, it's supposed to be immediately accessible for you and can tell you something about you when you play it. Um, so that's the aim. I'm not sure if we do that. And I know for, for me, I'm always saying we don't because I don't want to get complacent or tired. I want us to keep working harder and harder and harder. Um, and the hope is that we, something, um, I'm just gonna go off on a small tangent, but something that I wanted to do that I think archives don't do is iterate on past entries. And I don't, something that for me annoys me about archives is that sometimes they visit a place, they archive it, 50 years later, that place is very different, but they don't re-archive it. They don't re-question what they have in. They don't get the people in to look at the representation they currently have and say, this doesn't work. So for me, I'm really interested in re remastering these archives I currently am making so that we can keep building a new version of them so that we can see the growth of how people have changed and why you need to um, record that change. That change is something that should be recorded um, 
and not instead of forgetting something of the past, for example, like a dead name, instead the change is important to record. So I have changed from this to this. That is an important thing to record, to say this happens, this can happen, and this here is the proof of it. That's my spiel. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, before we go to the uh, questions from the audience, I have a question maybe for both of you, but maybe it's best if Eudertis, because it's based on the idea um, that Eudertis suggests uh, that anti-racist decolonial feminism requires organizing a political project based on solidarity and coalition. Uh, so my question is, you know, for both of you, uh, what do you think are the challenges and complexities of building such a project across different identities? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, bueno, a ver. Well. I, I believe that it has to do with the value of criticism and also self-criticism, um, the possibility of judging what your commitment is with political projects or with everything that you're working with. So what your commitment is and how that is going to reproduce or continue that program of Western modernity. I think that is important to think about. The second thing that you need to consider is the following. First of all, I think that there is an important need to establish partnerships or coalitions with those parties who are the, the the ones with, with power or influence. I mean, we are the majority and we have been the condemned people, as I said. And there is this need to create a certain coalition or a certain partnership with racialized people. That's important as well. And I think that's happening already. So you see, I've been working with this for a while already i've been on this for over 30 years now in this type of movement and i have witnessed many times before in the past 15 years at least i would say or at least the past two decades for around 20 years i see that this movement has gained has gained momentum this this movement that is more and more radical with these narratives. Can you hear me okay in, in English? Some, somebody told me that there is no translation, but I think you can hear me, right? Yes. We can hear you. Oh, sorry about that. I think somebody didn't press their button or something. So, as I was saying, in the past few decades, we've seen this movement that is gaining more momentum of racialized people and from the world, from the South and also from the North, you know, many immigrants in the North, in the global North. And I would say that more and more we can hear their voices we're trying you know to impose that we're trying to tell people that it is important to hear those voices basically so this is no longer with the previous rules and conditions oh you have to speak correctly you have to express yourself according to the western world rules and conditions if you know what i mean so now we're looking at that knowledge in a different manner we're going beyond what knowledge is we're redefining that and we're redefining in a way 
the extension of this movement. And there are so many issues connected to that. There are some people who are just searching for representation and they're willing to negotiate. They're willing to negotiate because they want to have a place there. So they're willing to start with that political project within the feminist movement, within the left wing movement, within the art movement, within any movement, right? So we see that expansion of awareness. We see that in art, for instance, we see more and more artists, if you notice, that are part of this political movement as well. Whether they really know about that or whether they haven't completely noticed that, but they are representing the world and self-representing as well. And their way of building things and thinking about things, they're production of beauty and art, they're putting all that to game and they are also more or less radically, they are also dealing with, with that classical idea or traditional idea of art that we're all used to. So I think that is still a priority. I think that we have come a long way already, but it is interesting to see that in the new generations and the future, the new generations are no longer going to see something completely empty. They're going to see some different paths, some different movements of people who were there before and have done their tasks. As Audrey Lore was saying, for instance, she was telling everyone she was doing what she had to do. We're all doing that. That's very important. We're doing our homework, basically. So that's important, even though it is a challenge. The challenge is going to continue there. But the thing here is that this is not just about an, an identity thing that is on the table. We're not just going to repeat whatever is defined by the Western world. Not anymore. We're now going to rethink all those aspects in modern times. And I think we have people now who have been fighting in that regard. And there is this need to continue to highlight that this is not just about being there but also trying to disassemble the traditional way of thinking. We have to rebuild the whole foundation. We have to live this. We have to experience this in a different way. And we have to also validate that new building, that new house that we're going to build as something that is possible, something that is okay to serve as a new foundation, as a project, as a political project as well, as a program for all of us. Well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sudakis. Uh, Danielle, I don't know if you want to comment. You don't have to, but you know, if the if you want to say anything about the idea of coalition, of solidarity, if that is important for what you envision for the future. I, I think you kind of covered it most of it, to be honest. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you covered it. Okay, that's fine because we do have a lot of questions from the audience. So let's uh, look at some of those. The first question here is for Danielle. How are they using the games to show their personal experience? Are they using as a medium or uh, why do they choose the game language to send their message? Yeah, games. For me, I feel like games are very like an untapped market. Like often um, there's a whole conversation in video games. They say, don't put politics in our games. And for me, I feel like a game is a completely great place to put politics and have um, your choices influence what happens because you feel responsible for, what, for the outcome of the um, experience. And so for me, using a game enables me to put choices in that reflect you. Um, as as the individual that you are. And so the choices that you have made to get to your position now, you bring with you into the experience. And so that when you are thinking to make a decision, we can use um, how, how you're thinking essentially against you or for you 
to create an experience that feels very much like it's questioning you and questioning why you have made certain decisions in your life or within this particular experience. Um, I feel like games are, I just, I feel like there's not many uh, games that actually enable and center black trans people at all. Like there are none. Um, I can't even think of one or maybe half of one. Um, and so for me, I kind of use it cheekingly as well to say like, okay, I'm a black trans game developer. I'm putting myself in that space in order that there is someone there. And I hope that someone comes along and is a way better game designer than me and just destroys me and puts me out of the water. Because I feel like sometimes without seeing a representation of someone, you don't feel like that place could be for you at all. Um, and so sometimes using these names, using these monikers, um, can kind of challenge the perception of what a game can actually do. And quickly, I just want to answer another question. I think we may have some trolls, but someone is saying, oh, why do you um, use similar tropes in your games, like gauze dresses, large breasts? Um, I don't, I actually don't have any breasts in my work. <laughs> um, I don't have any gauze dresses in my work. If you play them, you'll see. Um, and also the comment by Nadia um, Hussein in the, in the chat, we don't all speak English here. Um, like, and wh while Yaxis was speaking, I was thinking like something that we need in solidarity is that not everything can serve to you on a plate. You're gonna have to do some work yourself and understand that um, people don't all speak the same kind of language that you're speaking. People don't speak the same way you're speaking. Sometimes it takes work from your side to understand how to understand them um, instead of saying words like we speak English here. No, we don't. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Um, there is a very big question for Yuderkis, and Yuderkis, I mean, this would take a very long to answer, but maybe uh, you have a specific thought to share. The question is, what is the task for feminist decolonial epistemologies? That's huge. Your microphone. La tarea de las epistemologías feministas de Well, what can I say? I think that everything I said here shows a little bit what the task is for feminist decolonial epistemologies. It is to to strip down the narratives and these tr these universal truths, quote unquote, produced by feminist theorists or produced by modernity or modern times about this of this body that is called woman's body or feminine body quote unquote so i would say all of these narratives these binary narratives that are imposed as something original or that comes from the origin this or like as a natural classification that's always existed and that the west when it started growing and progressing right it can maybe strip this down or dismantle this so i think that feminist decolonial epistemologists have a huge, huge task in terms of all our areas, actually. All these different areas where these narratives, these binary gender and narratives appear we have to be able to dismantle them and not only in terms of post-structural feminism but in terms of how this also responds to modern times and to coloniality it's part of the modern colonial world so this implies reviewing everything pretty much and when i talk about narrative what i mean is the all the theories the theoretical work but also the conceptual work and all of the thought that has been built on the idea of a body 
that thought that has been that thought that appears in all of life in everything that is thought about life and everything that exists in life and how life is organized it's all based on these modern thoughts let's say we have to be able to face this first of all fight against it criticize it refute it and then show how this is not universal at all this is just a point of view it's a colonial point of view so hegemonic it's the point of view of an um, well, first i think type of mentality but there are epistemologies and community organization ontologies in the best sense of the word that challenges these constructions and these representations on the body and these interpretations that we have of the existing world and i think that this is not just a debate about feminism or within feminism but in that debate and that like facing this classical feminism or this white feminism what we're actually doing is also facing the entire Western type of thinking, Eurocentric type of thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there, there are so many questions, uh, but to there's another one for Daniel again. Uh, recently, a transphobic artist was invited to speak at UAL. I and others within the university complained, but were told that the university had to uphold free speech and the talk wouldn't be about her political views. I wanted to ask about separating your art from your identity and also about the links between colonialism, white supremacy, and the current transphobic discourse in the UK, which revolves around the idea of there only being two genders. And on a more personal note, uh, they're saying I'm an LGBTQ white male student. I want to do things to help my fellow BAME trans non-binary friends and peers, but I'm also aware of speaking over them rather than for them in challenging things like this. Do you have any recommendations for me to use my voice to center the voices of minorities? All right, so I'll start with the where transphobic art artist invited. Um, I don't think you can separate them. Like, it's something that I don't believe. I don't believe you can separate someone's, uh, the way they're living their life from their art. It's not separated. It will be in there somehow. It will be in their friend group. It's been in those that have, they have mistreated. It will be in the way that they act, how they take up space. It's there. It's constantly there. Um, and for me, like, if you, you upholding free speech does not mean hurting someone else down the line that's not what upholding free speech is um this is often used all the time by universities when they don't want to fuss they say this person should be allowed to speak um but it's again the same thing being used to say uh we want to say something that could hurt you but you should not be able to say anything about it because we have this thing called free speech. But at the same time, if you tried to complain to the Dean about this, you could be excluded from school. You could be um, kicked out for school for a couple of days. I remember when I used to do protests, I used to be kicked out of my school for a couple of days. Like things like this kind of happens. Like, and it's constantly being used to undermine uh, legitimate points being brought up saying i'm worried about having this person in this school um because it's not really about this person coming in it's about the the subsequent people coming in after it's about the conversation that can come if this person's accepted in this space then my views can also be accepted and if my views can be accepted then your more extreme views and then it will go on and go on and so for me this just reflects kind of what is uh, at the level what the level these universities are at and how o nível em que se encontram essas universidades e como estão dispostas a defender for maybe monetary or like um not taking a stance um and so that's what i think about that um in terms of links between colonialism white supremacy and current transphobic discourse they're all completely connected that they're, they're, they're so tightly intertwined it's like a net with fish in it um I, like you cannot remove any of them from each other. Um, 
before I, I was just looking actually the history of the Carib uh, so I'm from the Caribbean I was looking at the history of the Caribbean and the Carib people and they believed that everyone had one soul and so the, they, the ground shared the same soul with the people and all of this um, and so when colonialism happened like they just removed all of that and said none of it exists anymore and here is the new way of living um, and so white supremacy colonialism and transphob transphobia are just forever going to be intertwined you can't have one without the other um, and all, all what we know about these things have stemmed from essentially someone placing a rule on someone else. And that's essentially um, what supremacy is. Um, on your more personal note, I would be like, so for me, I often think about the friends and the company we keep. And usually when you keep a company which is integrated, not integrated, diverse, and has a large group of people who are speaking um, of, of these, on these topics, you will be in the know. So it might be that instead of, because for me, I'm not a teacher. I, don't, I can't teach you what to do and how to use your voice. For me, it's about the company you keep and the space you make for others. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, some others for your turkeys now. Um, about you mentioned the influence of poetry, so they are asking you know about poetry recommendations related to feminism. If there are any you there, please, please. Yes, I really like this type of work. And this was a research that I carried out in a project that I was invited to work in by an artist, a German Bolivian artist. She's part Aymara and her mom is German, but her dad is Aymara and she was born and raised in Germany. Verena Melgarejo is her name. And she invited me to work in a project that she has that is translated into German. It's, there's been different activities for the last four years and we came up with a very nice workshop to, for children that migrated to Europe. In this case, it's in a German context. For Germany and Austria, to be more specific for both countries. In public libraries where we try to teach or show the origins or their families or parents' origins to these children that grew up in Europe and to give them an image from the point of view of indigenous and black poets. So we wanted to recreate this map using poetry and using the poetic voice and poetic representation and images that are used by these poets. So, we we see all that as the image of that culture that identity those bodies and that world so that was a beautiful thing because it has like a double registry we were building with the, the kids we were actually rebuilding the map with the children and it wasn't the colonial map you see where there are already borders and limits that are imposed by, by nations that have that legacy of coloniality. Actually, what we did was represent and build starting with all those other images that were trying to, to bring those poets to life. So we published a small book called Poesia de Color, uh, Poetry of Color, basically where we have basically many poets there 
many words from the Caribbean and other places. And after that, I continued to work with investigation. When I was working with that, with that small book, I noticed that it was very interesting to me to think about all those narratives being reconstructed. So I myself, I, I love reading poetry. So what I noticed was that all those images and the representations, I noticed that what these poets were doing, they were way different from the way that white poets or mixed poets represent themselves or European poets. So that's what I noticed. And, and then I started to investigate, investigate a little bit further. I published a small paper after a long research where I was trying to do that balance and, and connect that poetry voice coming from the feminist um, sphere in literature and how that would be still completely different from the other side. This is all still centered on gender, that representation of the poet about herself, about the world. It has to do with the fact that she is a woman. So the fact that she is a woman. Nevertheless, when we start studying and assessing or analyzing the self-representation of indigenous women or African-American women, for instance, we notice that that perspective is expanded and this is no longer centered on gender anymore. What happens in that case is that there is a lot more life into it and everything is connected, interconnected. There is no separation between the I and the others, the other men, the other women, the other people, nature, things, etc. So there is a series of poems that I read and that I put in this work. It is now being translated to German, German or English, if I'm not wrong. This is going to be published in Germany and in Austria as well. I can't remember correctly now if it's both languages or just one, but anyway. And the thing is, we're going to see how in those poems, we're going to dismantle that individualism of modernity, of modern times, and how we're going to actually see the experience of the white women and the European or Eurocentric women and how that is connected to the construction of the I built by the other poets. You see the indigenous women who are poets, etc. So I really liked investigating about that. I would love to continue researching along those lines. And actually, if anyone is interested in doing that with with me, with the team, it would be great because it is interesting to see how that concept of colonial is going to help us dismantle the entire network, really, built by modern times. So everything that we see, everything that we experiment, everything that we're used to has to do with that subjectivity that is very traditional that was done a long time ago, that was produced a long time ago. So we start to see different spaces here, different spheres that are not related to the traditional feminism. And we see how useful this criticism is that I mentioned before, because there is still so much to review and still so much that we can do to contribute to this movement. The idea is to bring more visibility and more value 
to these other narratives, these other ways of looking at the world or experimenting the world, because they've always been very invisible because of the Eurocentric world and modernity. So basically that is a little bit of the research that we did. Well, thank you, Yudakis. Uh, I'm aware that we're running out of time and I'm sorry that we are not going to be able to answer all of the questions, but there is one for both of you. And it's, uh, I'll try to translate quickly, but it's about uh, the idea uh, that the future is past. And so they are wondering about the eradication of progress. Uh, so the question is about, you know, how this idea that the future is past, how that temporality works, um, how it works in terms of maybe waiting for a better world. And they're connecting it also to the idea of this and that or on learning, you know, like this kind of waiting without expectations. And they think it also relates to Daniel uh, because of the user's expectations of the game and how, you know, you play with those expectations as well or bring them into the game. So maybe, you know, any last comments on those to close? Um, sure. I also put the translation in the uh, chat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, for me, so I wonder why the question of temporality of waiting for this notion of the future past has already been. Um, so, for me, um, it's never really about waiting. I, I don't feel it's about waiting. It's about knowing that there's something coming that has been influenced by like the past and present and then trying to shift things so that because um, even though that future is coming and it's been affected by what's currently happened and what's happened in the past it's not set in stone and so it can be shifted by work um, and for me it's never really about like waiting for these things to come it's about knowing what's come before arming yourself with the knowledge that you can and then using that knowledge to shift things to more appropriately uh, suit certain people um, so it's never if you wait for something to get better it's not going to get better like it just never will um, I, I personally believe that it won't um, and it would be a disservice for me to say that it will because if it is getting better, it's because someone else is doing the work and not the person sitting there um, not doing the work. And um, it's perhaps a modality strategy of retracing as the future has already been mission away without expectations. Um, I don't really know what to say about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you don't case any last thoughts? Well, what I'm thinking here is that, first of all, starting with the, the colonial epistemology, one thing that we rescue here is the multi-temporality that exists. There is this multi-temporality in existence that we're we're not always experimenting the world in the same way. That's what I mean. And that also includes the way that we live in terms of time and space. So the problem with modern epistemology here is that it basically will fragment time. There is this time that we're living simultaneously and as a unit but it tries to break it into different parts. They say there is a past, there is a present, there is a future. They try to fragment all that. But for many human experiences, for many ways of living, of experimenting existence, not just for humans, that idea of thinking about time 
think enough time about the past, the present, and the future is not really the way that it is experimented by everyone. So everything happens at once. It is a, a continuous thing. That would be an aspect that I would consider. And also, it doesn't have to do with the world not having expect expectations. Look, if we're thinking about the expectations of the future, that is in the past. We have to actually look at the time that is in the past, a time where life was better or more fair or where there was more justice and something that we don't have in the modern narrative and something that we have to recover for the future. So what they're saying, what they're trying to say is that there was a time in which we were much better than we were than what we are right now within this narrative that condemns the past as being the worst thing ever, something that, it, that has a huge delay, not, no development at all, like a past stage in terms of evolution. So that idea of the future is gone, that doesn't really call us for action. It actually calls us to remind us that maybe, not really maybe, that program, that modern program that has been suggested to us as the future of humanity, the only thing that that is serving to is to the desperation of existence. It's going to make our existence disappear. It's going to bring us to chaos. All those things connected to science fiction, you know, where you see a movie and everything is destroyed and all that. And a lot of people talk about the fact that it would be easier to think about the end of the world than to think about the end of colonialism. That's interesting, isn't it? It's easier to think about the end of the world than about the, the end of colonialism. Anyway, the very idea of thinking about that, the idea of thinking that that past that is ignored by the present society won't allow us to see a, a notion of justice, a, no, a notion of good living that could be useful for us thinking about the future based on technology, productivity, high productivity, based on controlling nature, controlling techniques, and controlling everything that exists, basically. So that's what they're proposing. I think. Anyway, thank you very much. I know we're running out of time. I think that's my final comment. Great. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I can't believe we ran out of time. Uh, I really wish you know we could we could meet in person and have a drink and <laughs> continue talking. Uh, but yeah, we need to stop. I want to thank everyone for listening and thanks again to the organizers. And very, very special thanks to Daniel and Guderkis for your super generous uh, talks, your incredibly complex, fascinating, and very important work. Uh, thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> thanks. For